From the Knights of the Round Table to the Nazis. The Holy Grail is the world's most sought after Christian relic. It symbolizes redemption, it symbolizes salvation, it symbolizes eternal life. This was the cup said to have been used by Jesus at the Last Supper. Objects that had come in contact with the body of Christ were particularly important. Credited with supernatural powers, it has been sought by knights and treasure hunters for centuries. It's, it's this incredible holy object that you search for on a, on a great quest. But were they all looking in the wrong places? Because one person thinks she has found it. Janice Bennett believes an agate cup in the Cathedral of Valencia is the Holy Grail. What's more, it has been on display there for more than 500 years. It's an important relic, it's an important symbol of Christianity, and it deserves attention and veneration. This is the story of her quest to uncover the truth. It really had all the makings of being one, one of the greatest stories in the history of, of humanity. If she is right, this is an amazing tale of courage and survival that could finally lay to rest the mystery of the Holy Grail. In 1991, whilst on holiday in Spain, American writer and historian Janice Bennett visited the ancient city of Valencia. After walking around the old quarter, she decided to visit the magnificent cathedral. It was here, quite by accident, that she stumbled on something bizarre and intriguing. I happened to notice a small chapel in the cathedral I was, as I was leaving. Entering the chapel, she saw an illuminated shrine behind the high altar containing a small chalice. Richly studded with pearls, rubies, and emeralds, this is Valencia Cathedral's most prized possession, the Santo Caliz, also known in English as the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail was a drinking vessel which was venerated. And the legends say why it was venerated. It was venerated as the cup of Christ from the Last Supper. According to Christian belief, the Last Supper was the final meal Jesus shared with his apostles in Jerusalem before he was betrayed and crucified. He took the bread and he said, this is my body. And he broke the bread and shared it with his disciples. And then he took the cup and he said, this is my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. And once again, the disciples drank from, from the cup. And then he said, crucially, do this in memory of me. So this was not just a one-off meal. It was something that he wanted his followers to repeat. of the core beliefs of Christianity. The sacrament of the Eucharist, or Holy Communion, derives from the words spoken by Jesus at that meal. The act has become central to all Christian worship. The Eucharist is the source and summit of the Christian life. It's really at the heart of, of everything we do, everything we believe. We believe that Christ is present under the appearance of bread and wine. And when we receive the bread and wine at communion, we are receiving Jesus. We are one with him.
But on that day in Valencia, to Janice it seemed almost absurd. Surely she couldn't be standing just a few meters away from the Holy Grail. I really didn't feel anything when I looked at it. It didn't speak to me in any way. I wasn't captivated by it. I wasn't particularly impressed. Janice noticed that none of the other visitors seemed particularly awestruck either. As I recall, there were only one or two other people in the chapel. They seemed to be either disinterested or, at the very least, unaware of what they were actually seeing. But even so, Janice's interest was piqued to find out more. I looked in the gift shop in the cathedral. The only thing I could find was a small brochure that had been rather poorly translated from Spanish into English. It didn't say much. But reading the booklet, Janice began to discover a little more about the chalice's history. She was hardly the first to be drawn into the mystery of the Holy Grail. The interest in chalices emerges from a desire to come in contact with something that had actually come in contact with the body of Christ. For centuries, grail hunters from all over the world have been searching for this miraculous object. It symbolizes redemption, it symbolizes salvation, it symbolizes eternal life. And in a way, the Holy Grail stands for man's quest for God, man's quest for truth. The Holy Grail in the Middle Ages became the motive of a lot of legends and romances and poetry, it became the symbol of the aspiration of any Christian knight to go on a quest for the Holy Grail. This is an incredible holy object that you search for on a, on a great quest. It represents chastity and purity. Along the way, it has become shrouded in myths and mystical powers. It heals wounds, you know, it, it offers salvation. So much so that even at the height of the Nazi regime, Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS, searched for the Grail, believing its powers would help win him the war. He converted a great castle into a modern-day Camelot with a ritual chamber and its own round table. He planned to display the Grail here, but he too failed in his quest. It's become the one object in the world that is almost impossible to attain. It's become a symbol of something far beyond human aspirations, the absolute pinnacle of, of what we desire. So over the centuries, the, the Grail has received many associations. Everything from St. Joseph of Arimathea and Glastonbury, King Arthur and his knights, the, the Templars, and more recently, Dan Brown, Indiana Jones, Monty Python. But essentially, beneath all these stories and myths is this idea of a cup that Jesus used at the Last Supper the night before he was crucified. So could this object in Valencia be the true cup of Christ? That same one everyone has been searching for? Janice's research showed whether this was or wasn't the real grail, people had been prepared to die for it. I found a very a small booklet that had been written by Olmos Canalda. Now, he was a Spanish priest who was actually responsible for saving this chalice from destruction during the Spanish Civil War. In the 1930s, Spain was a deeply divided country, politically torn between right-wing nationalist and left-wing Republican parties. As the Great Depression hit, the country fell into turmoil. After the king abdicated, 
the Republicans were elected to power and the army rebelled. Spain was in a state of civil war. And like all civil wars, atrocities were committed by both sides. It was a time of great violence and strife. And it's often forgotten that the church itself had a, a very difficult time. It was persecuted. Um, 13 Spanish bishops were put to death at the hands of the communists. Many churches were desecrated, plundered, things stolen, relic very stolen, priests and nuns and religious killed by the communists who had a hate against the church, which was a, a symbol for the ancient regime. In this climate, there was no respect for relics. Valencia and the chalice were in danger. At 9 a.m. on the 21st of July, 1936, four people celebrated mass with the holy chalice for the last time. As they said mass, hordes of soldiers began to surround the cathedral. They were very concerned. One priest locked and bolted the doors. At 10 o'clock, they felt the situation was so serious that they came up with a very dangerous plan. There just happened to be one woman in attendance at this mass named Maria Sabina Sway. So they asked her to carry out this rather dangerous mission. They enveloped the chalice in silk, wrapped it in a newspaper, and plan to smuggle it out. Sneaking through the church crypt, she carried her precious parcel beneath her coat. She had to walk through groups of armed soldiers. At any moment, they could discover her hidden treasure. But luck was on her side. Her brave action was just in time. They entered the chapel of the Holy Grail. They burned all the pews and confessionals. They even burned the tabernacle where it had been kept. The fire was so intense that many paintings and precious works of art were destroyed. But despite the destruction, the chalice had escaped. When the war finally ended, on March the 30th, 1939, it was brought out of its hiding place in the countryside and returned to the authorities in Valencia, where the chalice has remained in the cathedral ever since. That story really impressed me, so much so that I felt that even if this weren't the real Holy Grail, I didn't feel it would be a waste of time to investigate it because it, it was so deserving of having its story told by its own merits. But the key question for Janice was, if this was the real Grail, how had it got from the Holy Land in the first century to 21st century Spain? Of course, it was very important for me to trace the story of this chalice from the beginning. You know, how did it get from Jerusalem to Spain? 
Janice needed to work out how the cup might have left Jerusalem in the first place. Establishing the authenticity of any object that supposedly goes back to Jesus, whether it be the chalice, uh, the cross, the nails, is incredibly difficult, and it requires an awful lot of detective work. So Janice focused on the events following the Last Supper. Going back to the earliest traditions of the church, she discovered St. Peter was said to have gone from Jerusalem to Rome, where he became the first pope. Well, we believe that St. Peter was made the head of the church by Jesus himself. He's given the name Peter, which means rock. He is the rock on which the church is built. Janice felt it likely that because of his importance in early Christianity, St. Peter would have been given the cup and taken it to Rome. Certainly, something as precious as the cup used by Jesus at that Last Supper surely would have been saved in some way, surely would have been passed down, and St. Peter is the likely sort of person who might end up with it. She believed he would have then used this cup to celebrate the First Eucharist. Christians felt their relics were extremely important because they, they were really a link between past and present. They represented something that was sacred, something beyond human comprehension. But the fact that it could have been given to St. Peter was hardly proof. She needed to find more evidence. She looked into the earliest traditions of the Eucharist and discovered that when the Mass was codified, it had a very particular form of words. In the Roman Catholic Mass, we have two different versions of the consecration. You have the general canon and the Roman canon. And the Roman canon says not Christ took the cap in his hands, but it says, hunk preclarem galicem. What means this very jealous. By saying this very chalice, did it mean that when the Pope celebrated Mass then, they were using the actual Holy Grail from the Last Supper? Janice believed what is just tradition now was based on actual facts back then. The Roman canon of the Mass are, are the words that Jesus spoke at the Last Supper. It originated in Rome with St. Peter and his followers, his successors. So many scholars would believe that this was the actual cup that had been used by Christ and that the popes were very well aware of that fact. But 200 years after St. Peter may have brought the cup to Rome, disaster struck. Janice discovered that in 257, the Emperor Valerian instigated a systematic persecution of Christians. The bishops of Rome and Carthage were both beheaded. And the Bishop of Toulouse was tied to the tail of a bull and had his brains bashed out. The Valerian persecution, I think there was more of an effort to just, well, literally, in every sense, decapitate the church. So take the leaders, just kill them by decapitation. Straightforward execution, you know, this is what will happen to you if you carry on uh, in your insane, eccentric religious beliefs. Pope at the time was Sixtus II. Knowing he will be executed, the one thing he can do is preserve the cup. Janice read how he summoned a deacon of the church, a Spaniard called Lawrence, and asked him to safeguard the treasure. But the question was, had the grail been part of those treasures? 
So just on a whim, I started flipping through the files, hoping maybe I could find something about the life of St. Lawrence that might mention the fact that he had actually sent this cup of the Last Supper to Spain. Janice then continued her research and came across an amazing discovery. A copy of a 17th century manuscript containing material she'd never seen before on the life of St. Lawrence. This, I felt, was so significant that I ordered copies of the entire manuscript, had them sent to my home in the United States, and began to translate them. Janice Bennett had discovered the manuscript of Abbot Donato. It told how Pope Sixtus had given the grail to Lawrence, who, after defying the might of Rome, was put to death in the most horrific manner. He was placed on a gridiron, having been stripped naked, and he was slowly roasted to death. But such was St. Lawrence's faith and courage that he was able to make light of the situation and even jest as he was being roasted on that gridiron. And he even said at one stage, turn me over, I'm done on this side. But critically, Janice learned from the manuscript that before Lawrence died, he too had passed the chalice on to a fellow Spaniard. Donato was very explicit, he says, and he gave to Priscillus a co-disciple from the homeland of Spain, the cup in which Christ consecrated his blood on the night of the Last Supper. So here we have this direct, very explicit reference that also provides the name of the Spaniard to whom Lawrence entrusted such an important relic. So the chalice, had escaped with Priscillus, and Janice was building a strong case for Lawrence, getting the grail to Spain. According to tradition, he managed to get uh, a Spanish soldier, a legionnaire from Spain, to carry this relic to Huesca, where the parents of St. Lawrence had an estate. So it was kept by the parents, and it was safe there. So could the chalice have been taken to Huesca, a town in northeastern Spain? Janice traveled there and discovered at first hand how strong the cult of St. Lawrence remains there today. Further evidence linking the grail to Spain. In a way, Scott, it is so evident the importance that St. Lawrence has had for the people for so many years that this tradition is so deeply enrooted in their culture that the entire town seems to be dedicated to him. I mean, you see these martyrdom motifs everywhere on three churches dedicated to St. Lawrence. Really, it's, it's amazing. But if the chalice had been taken to Huesca, it was there that the trail went cold. And what's more, this coincided with the greatest period of turmoil and religious conflict in Spanish history, the Muslim invasion. I think it was safe then in Huesca, but the problem was that the Muslims came up from Africa and invaded Spain in the year 711. So at that time, Christians were really forming caravans all over Spain, going to the mountains in the northern parts to hide all the relics because they knew that they weren't safe. For the next 250 years, there was no mention of the Holy Grail. But then, the records say that in 1037, it reappeared in a secluded monastery high in the Pyrenees. I think the first time I went to San Juan de la Peña, I was immediately struck by this location. Mm -hmm. 
an absolutely magnificent monastery, very simple, but in such a, an incredible setting in the Pyrenees that it really invokes awe. San Juan de la Peña was an important strategic location, a burial place of Spanish kings and a safe haven for relics. A good part of northern Spain stayed Christian throughout this entire process, and that uh, remained uh, a stronghold and the, the point of resistance against Muslim occupation. We know the chalice was here in 1037 because of a remarkable historic event. It was the place where the first mass in Latin language was celebrated in 1037 at a council where the Roman mass was introduced into Muslim Arabic Spain. So when the papal delegate introduced and celebrated for the first time the Roman mass, he consecrated with this important relic. After the Cardinal had used the Holy Cup of the Last Supper in the celebration of the Mass, San Juan de la Peña became a center for pilgrimage. So there were thousands of people every year passing by. They liked to tell their, their stories of, of the relics along the way. And so the knowledge of this relic became very well known throughout Europe. However it had got there, from this point on, the cup was hugely venerated on this site as the Holy Grail. Janice believed she had found a firm trail of evidence, taking the chalice from Jerusalem to Rome and now to the north of Spain. She now needed to discover how it got to Valencia. Janice read that after centuries safely stored in the remote monastery of San Juan de la Peña, the grail was on the move once again. Reading the monastery's records, she discovered how, on September the 26th, 1399, the cup she had seen in the Cathedral of Valencia was handed over by the monks as a gift to the king. It sets forth all the details of this transfer, of how he took it to his palace, the Aljaferia, in Saragossa. And he mentions the fact that this is the cup that Jesus used at the Last Supper and that it was sent to Spain by St. Lawrence. From then on, she found out that successive monarchs kept the grail with them and it moved about their royal courts from Zaragoza to Barcelona and then finally, Valencia. And we see it is moving more and more south because during the centuries, the front between the Christian Knights and the, the Muslims moved more and more to the south until in 1492, Spain was completely Christian again. By 1428, the chalice was in the Cathedral of Valencia, where it has remained ever since. For Janice, it was all coming together. Finally, she believed she had tracked the complete journey of the chalice from Jerusalem to Valencia. But it was now that the difficult questions began. It could conceivably have been a cup that had come from Rome. But that didn't mean it was the cup of Christ used at the Last Supper. Proving that would be much more difficult. I did most of the work at home, of course. I, I would have copies of everything made in the National Library or wherever I found them. Or when possible, I bought the books themselves and brought them home with me so that I could do it in my own home and, and piece everything together that way. I took many photographs along the way so that I would have that record as well. Amongst the problems she faced were the many rival grails. Well, we believe that by the 16th century, 
there were at least 20 chalices or other objects that claimed to be the Holy Grail. There are three well-known grails today. The Genoa chalice, now proven to be a glass dish of Islamic origin. Then we have the Antioch chalice, which is a beautiful silver work with a lot of decoration and human figures around. But the human figures alone prove that it must be Byzantine because in Judaism, human figures were forbidden. And if the Antioch chalice was too recent, then the wooden Nantius cup, with no provenance before the 19th century, was no contender either. One by one, Janice ruled out the pretenders. But how could she prove that the cup in Valencia was the real one? The solution had to be in proper archaeological testing. For one thing, the object needs at least to be intrinsically plausible. So it needs to be something that does come from the first century, or at least plausibly comes from the first century, uh, is something that somebody like Jesus, a Jewish peasant from Galilee, might have had, or his sponsors or friends might have had. Janice discovered that the only detailed independent scientific analysis done on the chalice was by Dr. Antonio Beltran in the 1960s. Professor Beltran was the professor at the University of Zaragoza, a leading Spanish archaeologist who, in the 1960s, was commissioned by the Archbishop of Valencia to study the relic of the Santo Calis from an archaeological point of view and to date it. A prolific academic author, and one of Spain's leading archaeologists. Beltran was also an expert on artwork of the ancient world. Dr. Beltran felt that he didn't have to worry about whether or not it was authentic, that he could just proceed without concern about what the church would think if he saw that this wasn't possible to have been on the table of the Last Supper. Dr. Beltran's findings were startling. He stated that the chalice was made up of three distinct parts. The base, the stem, and the upper cup. And they were all from different periods. The gold work linking the base to the upper cup was the most recent. At a certain point, Probably in the 14th century, those two stone elements are put together. The gold work seems very much in keeping with what gold work is in Spain in the 14th century. If you see the golden frame, this is clearly medieval work. There's no question about it. Dr. Beltran said the base was made of chalcedony stone. He concluded, it was probably an inverted incense burner, chosen as a base to support the cup because of its similarity in color and material. But its design and poor quality of craftsmanship indicated it was possibly from as late as the ninth century and so couldn't have anything to do with the true grail. Beltran then focused all his attention on the upper cup. It, too, was made from chalcedony, but exquisitely crafted and of a very high quality, similar to those made at a very specific period of time. And he dated it into the Hellenistic period, 3rd to 1st century before Christ. And you can prove it very easily that this dating is correct by just comparing it with other archaeological discoveries from this period. And there was more than it just dating from the right period. According to Beltran, the upper cup was a great example of a luxury stone item from the skilled workshops of the Eastern Mediterranean, the very area Jesus Christ came from. He said that these stone cups were fabricated in 
in workshops in Egypt, Syria, and the Mediterranean, that they were actually very common in Greek and Roman times and that they were used on luxurious tables. They were almost entirely made of, of hard stone, like chalcedony, and they were very expensive to make. Critically, these valuable vessels stopped being manufactured around 50 AD when they were replaced by glassware, which was cheaper and quicker to produce. So according to Beltran, the upper cup is definitely of the right design and type from the right place and period. But trying to tie a specific object to a specific moment in history, like the Last Supper, is almost impossible. There's no way to prove scientifically it was the cup of Christ. But what you can prove is that there is a possibility that it was used by Christ. To try and find that proof, Janice went back to the historical context of the Last Supper. Could this have been the type of cup Jesus might have used? Jesus was Jewish. And the chalice of the Last Supper was used for a Seder, for a Passover meal. The Bible tells how in the last week of his life, Jesus went to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Passover. Passover is one of the most important festivals in the Jewish year. At this time, Jewish people remember how God liberated them from slavery under the pharaohs in ancient Egypt. In preparation for the Passover meal, everything must be thoroughly cleansed or koshered. Anything porous or with cavities that cannot be ritually purged isn't used. So the chalice used for wine at the Last Supper had to have been pure. This would have ruled out wood and other materials. We also did not use a clay chalice because clay might have had little captivities in it. They did not use silver because silver was used for pagan coins and you had pagan deities imprinted on it. Stone was the obvious answer. You find stone vessels all over the Holy Land in Jewish uh, settlements from the time of Christ, in which they kept water for purification. So the perfect choice would have been a stone vessel. And indeed, the Holy Grail in Valencia is a stone vessel made out of beautiful agate. It was the type of cup that would have been used at such a celebration because it was hard, it was non-porous. But this sheer craftsmanship and quality presented an entirely new problem. How could Jesus, who famously wanted nothing to do with wealth and riches, be using such a valuable cup? Once again, Janice looked to the Bible for clues. Looking back at the accounts of the Last Supper, in the book of Mark, she discovered that the Last Supper was held in a cynical or dining room. And there was something unusual about this room. According to Christians and many biblical scholars, the, the owner of the cynical was a wealthy man. And we know that because it insinuates that in the Bible, that this was held in an upstairs room. There were servants present. At that time, having a house with a first floor and servants would imply considerable wealth. If she is right, Jesus was an honored guest of a wealthy family. And on an occasion as special as Passover, it is likely that only the very best tableware would have been used. So it was natural because this was a, a very expensive cup. It would have been priceless for this family even before the Last Supper took place. So if the upper cup was the type of cup used at the time, it begged the final question. Why had it been joined with medieval gold work and studded with jewels?
Janice discovered that embellishing relics was a popular practice in the Middle Ages. Obviously, it stands to reason if you've got something incredibly holy, why not make it holier? I mean, you want to give people their money's worth when they come and see it. So um, deck it up in gold and jewels, whatever you've got to hand. There's a cynical uh, element to that, of course. You know, it, it is effectively a tourist attraction. But there's also a more spiritual dimension as well. After Constantine, suddenly Christianity becomes a bit more worldly and there's a greater sense of beauty as a spiritual path. So studying beauty uh, would lead you to the true beauty, that is, God. And Christians were quite enthusiastic about this. But she also discovered there was a practical reason for the cup's transformation into a long-stemmed chalice. It is easier to celebrate Mass when you have a stem to hold on to and a weighted base. There's less chance of an accident happening uh, during the Mass. It's about sp spilling some of the precious blood. For Janice, it was all making sense. As all these pieces started coming together for me, I was really amazed by the incredible mosaic of art, culture, and history that was taking shape before my eyes. From a valued family heirloom blessed by Jesus at the Last Supper, the Grail traveled to Rome and was used by the early popes to establish and practice the Holy Mass. During the Valerian persecutions, this same cup was bravely spirited away to northern Spain, where it had become a rallying point for Christianity. And then from the 14th century, it became a prized treasure of the kings of Aragon, before entering Valencia's cathedral in 1428, where it has remained almost ever since. It really had all the makings of being one, one of the greatest stories in the history of, of humanity. Eleven years after first seeing the chalice, Janice was now convinced that the cup in the Cathedral of Valencia is the Holy Grail. Really, this whole quest for me I feel sometimes like I was led on it, um, that it was from something beyond me because I have no idea how it happened. She wrote up all her findings in the form of a book, St. Lawrence and the Holy Grail, the story of the Holy Chalice of Valencia. It's really now for the first time that, that people who go to the cathedral and enter the chapel of the Holy Grail can actually appreciate the, the rich history of this relic, that they can understand all the sacrifices that were made by so many people throughout the centuries, that they can really comprehend all the near misses with destruction this relic has suffered throughout the years and, and appreciate its history more. Of course, it is impossible to say for certain that this is the Holy Grail. There are many skeptics who are sure it isn't. And to a large degree, it comes down to circumstantial evidence. I guess the Valencia story is as plausible as any is for the last resting place of the Holy Chalice. The problem is it has, it has a whole bunch of weak links. We have to accept that it was kept. We have to accept that it was taken to Rome. We have to accept that the story of Lawrence taking it to Spain is actually true. And we have to accept that well, they did manage to hang on to it in Spain for all that time. But there's nothing impossible about any of them. You know, there's no, we don't need to believe in any miracles um, uh, for, for this to be true. So it's possible. For the faithful, the archaeological evidence doesn't refute the authenticity of the chalice. So no one can rule it out as the Holy Grail. And there are people in Spain who certainly believe it is authentic. So the chalice is a wonderful link with the past. 
in the present. It, it keeps tradition alive. Often it is very important in defining identity, the identity of a particular town or a church or a province. And it does help to unlock the mysteries of our faith, to bring home to people things that happened way back in the biblical past. In more recent times, the Valencia chalice has become more widely accepted. It seemed to have even received the endorsement of the highest Catholic authority. In recent years, there have been two papal visits to Valencia. The first was by Pope John Paul II in 1983. He venerated the, the holy chalice, he, he touched it. And there's a wonderful picture of him kissing the chalice, and then a bit later he was able to use it at the celebration of Mass. And if we are to believe that this was the custom of the popes in the early centuries of, of the church, then it was very much a return to papal custom, papal tradition, and the first time in over 1,700 years that the pope had used that chalice uh, for Mass. It's nice to believe that anyway. The second papal visit was in 2006, when Pope Benedict XVI also celebrated with the Holy Chalice. On the square in front of the cathedral, he called it the famous relic of the Santo Calice, which was very important because it was a recognition of the relic status. It was not only a symbol, but indeed a relic. Pope Benedict's choice of words, this most famous chalice from the Roman canon, seemed to support the tradition of the Holy Chalice of Valencia without actually authenticating it. But for some of the faithful, the question whether it is or isn't real doesn't matter. What is much more important is the meaning behind the quest for the Grail. So in a way, the Holy Grail has become bigger than simply an old cup that Jesus may or may not have used at the Last Supper. It really symbolizes something at the very heart of our human life. For people, for Christians all over the world, this represents salvation. It represents um, the sacrament of the Eucharist, something beyond this world, something that we can look forward to when we die, um, a better place where everyone will be happy. Today, this most famous chalice remains on show in Valencia's great cathedral for all to see, a focal point for belief and worship. We have to really admire the, and look at the faith of many, many generations. And in a way, the, the devotion of generations of Christians gives a relic a certain sanctity in itself. The fact that it's been the focus of prayer, that it's been the means of people encountering God, whether or not the relic is historically valid, that in itself gives a certain authenticity to the relic.